Hello, welcome to this week's video, which is all about the narcissistic cycle of abuse, how to spot it, how to recover from it, and also break free if you possibly can. I am going to be looking at three phases of said manipulation and abuse, which will be the idealization phase, and then the devaluation phase, and then the discarding phase. So, let's begin. The idealization phase. Now, this often takes the form of what's commonly referred to as love bombing, and you'll probably get sex bombing involved in that as well. What's love bombing, what's sex bombing, where they kind of go hand in hand. Basically, you are bombarded with someone's affections. You're amazing, uh, they treat you like a king or a queen. You're amazing, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. We're twin flames, kindred spirits, soulmates. Um, I've never experienced a relationship like this. They kind of latch onto you and spend as much time with you as possible whilst telling you how amazing you are and that you guys should make this kind of pact to be together forever. And you will tend to find this happens quite early on within a relationship. Now, slight disclaimer here, not everybody who does this is a narcissist. Yes, it can be a red flag if you come across it, but you should approach this with some level of caution and open-mindedness because some of us out there who have been on our own for a while or in and managed to escape the clutches of uh, more dysfunctional, distasteful relationships may well happen to come across somebody, um, perhaps you out there, and are completely overwhelmed by how amazing this is and how balanced and equal and all the rest of it, and they're really, really enjoying it, and their expression of it is to kind of go, blah, blah, blah. Um, and shower you with how they're feeling. It's not necessarily a red flag that you're involved with a narcissist. Call it an orange flag. Maybe it just needs to be kind of kept at the back of your mind a little bit. Okay, what's going on here? If it is narcissistic manipulation and abuse, um, or the beginning of that cycle of abuse, then it's commonly referred to as the idealization, idealization phase. So like I said, love bombing, sex bombing. Sex bombing kind of speaks for itself. Once you understand love bombing, the sex bombing process is the same as well. They will give you everything you want in the bedroom. Um, and they will want it a lot. Again, you could also be involved with someone who has a high sex drive and is just overexcited. But... It's the next phase where you will start to maybe where the red flags will pop up and you really need to start taking notes. So we move on from this kind of idealization stage, which can often be seen as fireworks. We move to the devaluation stage. This is where the your new partner moves from this kind of love bombing and full of affection and idealization of you to some cutting remarks, maybe some humiliation in there some put downs, a complete change of character. Now, if you put the two dynamics together, so hang on, I was being, for the first three or four months, I was the best thing since sliced bread, and you were amazing, and I felt amazing. Now I'm full of doubt. Now I'm kind of like torn between, mm, uh, uh, hang on, that wasn't particularly great, what you did there, uh, but you know, then all of this is great. What they've created is they've created something called cognitive dissonance within you. So if you take, for example, like a gestalt kind of approach, you will have built up an image of the other person. And this image is based on reality. They will become an object within your psyche. And then you will have dressed it with your own experiences and what you're experiencing in the moment. And there will be an element of reality within it and there will be an element of fantasy built around it. What then happens in the devaluation process or the devaluation phase is this image you have of your partner in your head now is kind of challenged and seems contrary to some of the things that you are experiencing. So they will literally start to devalue. They will t tell you um, you're no good at something. They will tell you you're um, too emotional. They will tell you things like, uh, you take everything negatively. You're, you're too dramatic. You can't cope without me. Oh my God, you're so pathetic. You're such a burden. I have to deal with this all the time. What's happening is they're devaluing you. There's a reason they're devaluing you is because they are gonna feed off your misery. They're gonna, the idealization stage, they're giving, they're, they're drawing their victim in. 
okay? Now they've got their hooks in you. Now they can start to play around with you and feel powerful. And the less powerful you feel, the more they, they are, they're kind of vampiristic. So the more they drain your energy, they're taking that energy. You look at it like this. What happens, as I said, is you get this cognitive dissonance. So now you've got these opposing kind of perceptions of your partner. And this in itself causes confusion. And this is what manipulation is about. Manipulation and control is about depowering you. It's about causing confusion, which means they can depower you. They can overpower you. They can control things. And they'll use things such as gaslighting and word salad and things like that in order to push the process forward. So they will get you to begin to question your reality, your your perception of reality. So there will be that, you know, the gaslighting comes from, you know, turning the lamps down and then telling your partner, I think it comes from a Broadway play or something or a film. It's about doing small things in the house and then you question that, you, you kind of go, oh, hang on, didn't you leave that out on the side? No, you did or um, I don't know, the kids have done this, your kids have done that. And you go like, I'm sure I saw you do it. No, 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 I didn't do that, it was, it was one of the kids. You're imagining things, you're seeing things, you're making shit up in your head, you're crazy. Um, they will begin to do all of these kind of things and you will seriously question yourself, your perception of reality, you will begin to lose trust in your own judgment because you have this cognitive dissonance because these things are actually happening because what has happened is the narcissist has flicked around they have revealed themselves they have changed character but you're already too far in to be able to step out well possibly chances are you're too far in you're too invested you're already trying to make them feel better i'm sorry i'll try harder i'm sorry i won't do that again i'm sorry that i made you upset i'm sorry that you think of me that way I will do some work on it. I'll go to therapy, I'll take some tablets, I'll go and see the doctor. All of this stuff, I mean, it gets quite sinister um, within the devaluation process. If you want to add in some attachment theory, we are creatures who look for connection. We are creatures who look for attachment. We want to belong to something. We want to partner with somebody. We like community. We like the union. We are fine by ourselves or, you know, if we work on that, but we do look for this and we are drawn to that. And that's what the love bombing stage does. It really pulls in that attachment. It gets you to attach, but it also kind of, the way they do it is it breeds some kind of dependency, which will then get used against you in the devaluation stage, as I've mentioned. So once you're attached, once you're in, once you're hooked, then the devaluation process starts and then you're still attached but you have this cognitive dissonance. You're unsure how you're going to break away from it. Should you break away from it? Is it the right thing? And the more you're depowered, the more you're devalued, the less likely you are to leave because you're not going to have enough self-confidence, self-worth and self-trust to be able to leave. And this is what they rely on. Then they will move to the next stage once you are this gibbering kind of crumbling wreck, unless you have picked up on it early enough and you have kind of gone, whoa, hang on a minute you need to stop what you're doing right now or we are done, in which case they will probably say adios pretty quick unless they don't have anywhere to go. And then they will start the process again, you get drawn in, then they start devaluing again. So it goes round and round in cycles because the narcissist always has to come out on top. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine as a narcissist, you don't come out on top, what that does to your self identity? They're unable to cope with that. Their whole fragile sense of self, their whole false self that they've built up around them for years will crumble and disintegrate. They're not about to let that happen. So they will discard you before you, before you are able to discard them. Now, this discard process can be quite slow or it can be quite quick and it will be harsh and boom and they're off probably quite quickly with somebody else. Um, at this point, they've found more narcissistic fuel supply and they're just after that because you're this wreck and you will be humiliated a bit further and further and you have an awful uh, long road of recovery to go. Now, depending on how long this has been going on for, depends on how much you might have to pick yourself 
up. If you have become like Echo in the tale of Narcissus and Echo, you will have an awful long way to go because you'll be a shadow of your former self. You will have experienced everything I said, the gaslighting, the word salad, uh, all of the confusion, the cognitive dissonance, you will, chances are they'll even try to vacuum you back up. So when they're off out there doing their thing, and then they decide, oh, this is a bit lacking, I'll see if they're still interested. There's a reason they do that, because if you, if you go for the, if they cast the hook, fly the kite up, and you respond, they get some narcissistic kick out of it. They get some fuel supply from it. And it's like, I've still got them and I can have them back like that and then I can manipulate them again and drain them. So once a narcissist has left your life, make sure they stay gone. Work on yourself. There is, There will be, and this is some of the hardest stuff to do, there will be reasons that, and I don't want to do, it's not about victim blaming. There will be things about you that they saw, that they latched onto. Maybe you were very lonely. Maybe you were quite vulnerable. Maybe you wear your heart on your sleeve and you fall in love too quick. Um, maybe you are terrified of being alone. Um, they will see these weaknesses of yours, if you like. They will see these attributes of you, your hopes, your desires, your dreams, and that's what they head for, because they will spot you out like a victim. So they'll go, ah, this one's gonna be easy. I can manipulate this person. Narcissists don't try and waste time manipulating someone who can't be manipulated. manipulated. They don't try and waste time manipulating someone who is too emotionally closed, is not interested in love etc etc they manipulate and control for their own gain so they look for the most susceptible if you can kind of do some of the work on yourself afterwards and figure out ah yeah this is what it is i love too quick i give too much of myself away i become quite codependent quite quickly um i've got mummy issues i've got daddy issues etc etc um, i'm desperate for love i hate being on my own these are some of the things where you kind of can go, okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but they do leave me vulnerable for manipulation. So I need to work on some of these things, get a little bit more robust in these areas, get a little bit more strength, a little bit more uh, self-esteem, self-worth, self-sustaining, able to enjoy my own company, not be in too much of a rush to get into a relationship, take things slowly, let things unravel, let things expose themselves before I kind of, really, really fully commit. And it's from this learning. And the, here's the other thing that I would like to say as well. If you have been caught up with a narcissist and you have been through that cycle of abuse and manipulation and control, it isn't your fault. They are hard to spot. They are hard to see coming. And you, it might happen to you once or twice or three times or four times because the disguises get better and better. They get The better you get at spotting it, the better they get, well, the more advanced ones will come your way and try and pick you out, if that makes sense. And like I say, the idea is to go, okay, mm, orange to red flag there, red flag there, red flag there, adios, I'm done. I don't even need to wait and see where this goes. I know where this is going. If you are in a relationship and you come away and something doesn't feel right, something's a question, there's a doubt, it kind of shouldn't be there. So chances are, it's there for a reason. Trust it, listen to it, analyze it. Yes, relationships cause problems. Yes, relationships bring immense amounts of joy. But if you find yourself within, like I say, this kind of dynamic, and you're kind of like, I feel awful, I feel terrible about myself. I'm drained, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm questioning everything. I'm such a bad person. This relationship is not making you feel good. It is time to get out and leave and shut the door on it forever. And if they do contact you again, hi, bye, or don't respond at all. Uh, I hope that helps. And until next time, please take very good care of yourselves. Adios.